May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Well, some of you know that I just bought my first home. And by my calculation, this is the 21st time that I've moved my household in my life. And if you've ever moved, you'll know that you're never more aware of how much stuff you have until you have to pack it, move it, and unpack it again, right? Every time I move, I think about how much I want to downsize, but I only end up upsizing. In this house, I've gained two bedrooms, two additional bedrooms, a bathroom, and an additional TV room. So, of course, now I'm trying to fill all the things with the, uh, oh, I had my family coming this week, so I'm make, buying beds and buying furniture and side tables and all sorts of things. And now that I'm a home, homeowner, I have an excuse to buy all sorts of fun tools. I've got a battery-operated caulking gun, moisture detectors, laser levels, automatic paint sprayers. If you remember Tim the Tool Man Taylor, I think he'd be very proud of me. And even better, now I have my first garage. And like a true American, after about a week of actually parking in my garage, now I can no longer park in it because I have so much stuff that I've got to go through. Now, I wouldn't be airing my dirty laundry if I didn't think that most of you in this room can resonate exactly with what I'm saying. In this gospel reading, a man came to Jesus to settle a legal dispute, which is something that rabbis did at the time. It'd be like going to small claims court, but instead doing it here at church. No, we do not offer that services here. He, wanted to, he wants Jesus to tell his brother to share his inheritance with him, to divide it. And Jesus' immediate response, his first word was very stern. He said, man, he didn't call him child or brother or beloved like he does a lot of times, but man, one comment, a commentator said that Jesus addressed him as a stranger, as if this man and his attitude were a stranger to God. He knew where the man's heart was oriented, and it wasn't towards the Lord. In Jesus' time, of course, wealth, the accumulation of things was largely cattle or food or land. So in this parable, the man wants to tear down his barn because he has so much stuff that he needs a bigger barn to hold it all. Not just what he needs to survive, or some as backup, but an abundance. And we kind of gather from the parable that he has no intention of being generous, sharing with others, but hoarding it all to himself. When I read scriptures about riches, abundance of riches, wealth, and treasures on the earth, sort of my default image is something like the old cartoon, DuckTales. If you remember George McDuck, he was a rich man. And he had a vault about the size of this room and he would jump off a diving board, defying physics, and swim in his pile of gold, spitting out the coins like water. That's sort of my, my, uh, where I, my thought goes. So my instant reaction is because I don't have an abundance of wealth like that, a big vault, and I'm certainly not wealthy, that these scriptures really don't apply to me. But today, of course, things look a little different for most of us. We don't have vaults filled with money or barns filled with food or cattle. But the nature of the parable hasn't changed, and our sinful nature hasn't changed. Our possessions may not be a deliberate storing or abundance of food or a safe filled with gold. Most of our money is invisible. It's stored in banks. And our possessions aren't in a barn, but they are hundreds of gadgets gaming system, vehicles, toys, tools, art. The average person today has so much more than the common person throughout history could ever imagine having. Even those in the U.S. who statistically live in poverty generally have way more than people uh, on the rest of the world and throughout history. Most people in the U.S. have a roof over their heads, a car, a smartphone, computer, internet access, more than one pair of shoes, one set of cl- more than one set of clothing, education, access to health care. In this story, Jesus addresses the heart of the man's greed, the greed in his heart. He said, take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Of, cor- of course, our world doesn't tell us that, right? Our world tells us quite the opposite. 
that we are actually the sum total of our possessions. But I think the funny thing is most people won't admit that. Even if you ask probably the most vain and greedy person, do you think that a person's value or your own personal value is related to how much you own? They'd probably say, of course not. And I think the average person who doesn't have a lot of money, Christians included, wouldn't say that either. But everything we do in this culture points to otherwise. See, when money is king, then our whole lives are built around and oriented towards money or things. When I say money, just think possessions. So we, what kind of job we have defines how much money we have. What college we go to, or if we go to college at all, will define what job we get and how much money we have. What we do in high school will define what college we get into, which would define what job we have and how much money we earn. The activities and education we have in elementary and middle school leads us to what kind of high school and, uh, we go to and what kind of sports we're involved in, getting into good colleges, having a good career, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I worked in youth ministry in the D.C. area for a couple years, and the number one stressor among the students was the pressure that they felt from their parents and their peers to get good grades, to be involved in multiple sports at the same time, multiple clubs at the same time, advanced classes, college classes, so they can get into a good college. And of all the suicidal ideations, depressions, drug abuses, this, the pressure to perform was the leading cause among the students I was ministering with. And probably the number one excuse I heard from parents and students is the why they don't have time to read the Bible or go to church or go to youth group, go on retreats, to do things that generally disciple them in Jesus Christ is it was too much homework, too many demands in sports, too many clubs, or parents too busy in their careers to form their children at home in Christ. Of course, not having time is an excuse. The problem is about the condition of their hearts. And so why is this? Why do parents and students endure the stress of all this stuff for years? I think generally it's because the, the end goal is to be successful, to get into good schools, get great jobs, have great money, to have nice things. And actually, I thought that was an anomaly in the D.C. area because I didn't grow up that way and many of my friends didn't. But I'm learning as I've been around in other parts of the country that that's actually the case in most middle and upper class societies in America. S same here in Tallahassee. Life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, Jesus says. If you've read the ACNA Catechism to be a Christian, question number four says, what is the way of death? The answer is the way of death is a life empty of God's love and life-giving Holy Spirit, controlled by things that cannot bring me eternal joy, but that only lead into darkness, misery, and eternal condemnation. The world tells us if we just had more money, more things, and more success in our careers, that we, we, be, we will be happy. And if that's the case, if that's true, then you think that the people in Hollywood would be among the happiest people on the planet. Instead, Hollywood is wrecked with alcohol and drug abuse, multiple divorces, suicides, and we're learning more recently the rampant sexual abuse and pedophilia that exists in Hollywood. And we could say the same for politicians and sports stars and royal families. And of course, it's not just famous people, it's not just wealthy people. Just look at our personal household debt levels in this country. It's topped over $4 trillion. The average personal debt, not including a home mortgage in America is $38,000. And much of that, we have to be honest, much of that is living beyond means, not a necessity to survive. We want things so bad we can't even afford them and we go into massive debt to get them. Then we get enslaved to debt, enslaved to money. And in an age where we have more than any time in history, people's desperation to be happier and wealthier and healthier maybe at an all-time high. This is why the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel is so popular. It's this idea that if you have enough faith, God will abundantly bless you with wealth, health, fertility, happiness, success. And millions and millions of people tune in or attend these churches every week. 
And it's not just the Western world that's struggling with this prosperity gospel. A couple years ago, the Gospel Coalition published an article titled, Prosperity Teaching Has Replaced the True Gospel in Africa. When I was in Kenya last year, I, I saw this firsthand. The prosperity gospel is, is spreading like wildfire there. Places where people have very little, people want more. That's natural, right? And what's kind of worse is, is many of these places, they watch our movies, they watch the Western world of movies on TV, and they want what we have. If only they knew that it actually didn't make us any happier, and in some cases makes us unhappier. In this parable, the man who builds a brand new barn filled with all new things, he says to his soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. If only I had more money, I'll be happier. If only I had a nicer car, I'd be happier. If only I had a better job, I will be happier. But it's usually never enough. We always want more. Spending money, shopping, it becomes a coping mechanism for many of us, for other pains deep inside. I remember as a kid, I got some toy. I don't remember what it was. It was probably some nerdy electronic kit from Radio Shack. I shouted, yay, now I could die happy. Of course, I probably picked that up in a movie or TV show, but my dad heard me. Woo, tell you what, he corrected me quickly, and because he's a priest as well, I think he probably preached a sermon on it to me. Ecclesiastes 5.10 reads, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth his income. This is also vanity. So I know so far my sermon sort of sounds like a Dave Ramsey show, and that's not my aim. My aim is not to preach about getting out of debt or, or, or that having abundance of things or accumulate, accumulation of wealth is bad. That wasn't even Jesus' point. And I'm not saying go home and start bringing things to the curb. That downsizing automatically will make you happier or your faith in Jesus Christ will be increased. Jesus wasn't saying that either. That's sort of a reverse prosperity gospel. As Jesus typically did, he was going around the actual surface issue and going directly to the core of the problem. The last line of the parable starts with fool. And as Father Michael said at the earlier service, If God calls you fool, you're probably a fool. God says, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? The one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Our possessions, they don't follow us into heaven, into all eternity. Our money doesn't resurrect with us. And thank goodness our lack of money doesn't resurrect with us either. Our 401ks, our wardrobes, our college degrees, they don't resurrect with us. I don't think there's an electronic funds transfer process between here and heaven. And I'm sorry that those of you who have beat up cars, your car does not get a resurrected body in eternity. Uh, Only we will. And honestly, I don't think there's anybody in this congregation that's, that's at risk of believing that our earthly wealth actually plays into our salvation or that it follows us into eternity. But why do we live like this anyway? Jesus also said that it was actually more difficult, not impossible, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. It's not that rich people don't go to heaven or that poor people are automatically saved. But the point is that oftentimes, the more worldly riches that we have or a person has, the more that distracts them, consumes their life leaving no time for God, no need to trust in God, because you could just trust in your money. And conversely, it's often the poorest people in the world who have nothing, who have the strongest faith, because sometimes their faith in Christ is all they have. Psalm 49 really summarizes this well. Be not envious if one is made rich, or the glory of his house is increased, for he shall carry nothing away with him when he dies. Neither shall his glory follow him. For while he lived, he counted himself happy. As long as he did well for himself, people spoke well of him. He shall follow the generations of his father and shall never see the light. Those who are honored but have no understanding are like the beasts that perish. So 
how are we to respond to this passage? Question six of the catechism says, what is the way of life? And the answer is, the way of life is directed towards loving and responding to God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of God's indwelling Holy Spirit and leading us to eternal life. And the catechism also says that the Anglican rule of life, although this can be applied to any Christians, is common prayer, a life of witness, service, and devotion of our time, money, and possessions to God. As Christians, we know and need to be reminded often that our time on this earth is transitory. Our, everybody's time is transitory. And our salvation and our, sal- our salvation comes from faith in Christ alone. Not money, not careers, not the number or quality of your possessions or your toys. And we know that our, our things, make, they make us happy for a moment, that's true, but they have no bearing in eternity. So I want to leave you with a few thoughts. Number one, if you find that building riches on this earth or taking priority over building your richest, richness towards God, you need to evaluate your priorities. How much time and energy are you spending building and managing all your money and your possessions? Because I've been super busy moving and unpacking my house and working on my house. I find that prayer and devotional time goes out the window, usually the first thing to go out the window, because I'm so busy with my things. Number two, and this one's for parents, but also kids. Most parents want their children to have a better life than they did. That's only natural, and that could be a very good thing. But here's my question. What is this better life that you're striving for them? Is it more money, more fun things, more vacations, better schools and careers in the future? Those aren't bad things. But how does their spiritual life fit into that picture? A better spiritual life than you had. Do you spend more time and energy pushing your kids to excel in academics, sports, and clubs than you do their attending and involvement in church or Christian education, Christian service, or formation in Jesus Christ in your home? And three, remember that all things come from the Lord. All of our money, they're God's. Our careers, they belong to God. It was given to us by God. Be generous, not just with the church, but with other people. Not just with your money, but with your house and your things. Be generous, because it all belongs to God anyway. If you find yourself being greedy or selfish, or consumed with what you have or what you don't have, you need to check your heart. And four, learn to be content with what you have. Again, Jesus never condemns being successful or having money or having a good job or having great possessions. He warns against the love of money, the greed, the selfishness, and building riches at the expense of building riches towards God. The author of the letter to the Hebrews wrote them, he said, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. You see, you could spend your whole life preparing for this earthly life to make it comfortable, but neglect to prepare for the eternal life to come. And the very fate of you and your children are at stake. We are on this earth for a blip in eternity. We're here to glorify God, not ourselves. And God is offering his hand of salvation through Jesus Christ. He's offering a new heart, a peace that passes all understanding, an eternal abundance of riches that we can't even comprehend in a new body, in a life eternal with him forever. So this is, as Christians, This is what we believe. Let us remember that as Christians, we should be set apart from this world, not hinge our life on building richness on this earth, but on the riches of the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.